Welcome everybody to the latest edition of the Scholar Gypsies. Today's guest is independent Senator Ronan Mullen. I've asked uh, Senator Mullen to come on here today to have a chat about the hate speech legislation that's winding its way through the Dáil and the Senate, Janet. And also we're going to get into the a lot of the... Um, are some of the trans debate and um, problems therein with the, a lot of the trans ideology stuff. I was going to touch on recent protests as well. Um, before we get to that, um, if you're watching this on my Substack, please subscribe at your email to westawake.substack.com. It's free. And just pop in your email address. If you're watching it on YouTube, just click like and share. The, there's links to support my work in both, um, um, so you can do that if you want or don't. Um, so without further blathering, let's jump into the first question. Our Senator Mullen, excuse me. Are you all right um, the first time, Jerry? <laughs> is, uh, I'll start with a simple question. Um, What's your gut tell you, or what do you think? Will the hate speech legislation get passed as we sit here today? Well, there can be a tendency among politicians to kind of predict whatever that whatever they want, or want to encourage people to do, that to predict that that's going to happen. Um, but it, it's not that simple. I think clearly the government have the numbers in the Shannon to push through whatever they want to push through. You know, two thirds of the of the 60 members of the Shannon are on the government side between Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and the Green Party. And uh, since I don't imagine that there'll be any free votes on this issue, that should suggest that once the government decides to bring this to the Shannon, you know, that they would get it through sooner or later. However, it may not be that simple. First of all, the government know that they're going to get a hard battle on this one. Uh, in the Shannon, it isn't just myself, it's people like Senator Michael McDool, Senator Sharon Keoghan, Senator Gerald Crockwell, I think, has expressed uh, concerns about this. Um, and within the parties as well, I think there is an understanding that there's something off about this legislation, that it doesn't meet the usual uh, standards of precision that you would expect when it comes to defending people's you know, fundamental rights, and obviously freedom of expression is one of those. Um, you know, what Senator Lisa Chambers has had to say on the issue was helpful in, in, in recent times. And therefore, I would like to think that behind the scenes, there is some kind of pressure on in the parties to get the government and the minister, Helen McEntee, to accept that, um, that, that, that important surgery is needed before this legislation is finally put to the vote in the Senate specifically around the definition of hatred, but there's also the problematic definition of gender and how that might be used and abused. There's the question of the quality of the defences that's in the legislation. There's the question of whether the mere possession of material that's deemed to be offensive or potentially, you know, in that vague way seen as capable of inciting hatred, whether that could be a, a, a criminal offence and, and the consequence of that for, for civil liberties. So I, I think that the government knows they're going to get a hard battle on this. So then the question is, well, let's say they, they, they know they're going to get a lot of amendments proposed, which they are, and some of their own members are going to be saying, you know, some of these amendments are sensible and, you know, and they're under moral pressure not to guillotine the legislation, which governments sometimes do, but it always has a very bad smell, you know, when they close off a debate and push it to a vote before amendments have been considered, etc., and given that there's an election not that far away, we have local and European elections um, uh, taking place in May. And of course, the next general election could be next okay. autumn. It can't be any later than, than early 2025. So the government will be trying to calculate, I suppose, is that, you know, how widespread is the public discontent about this legislation? Has the have the ideas that this that the critics of this legislation have been ventilating, not just in social media, but very strongly in social media, um, have those kind of caught hold with, with 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 a wide section of the population, wider than just what the government might like to dismiss as the cranks or you know people of very kind of particular views that they regard as not. Um, 
um, uh, hitting the mainstream. And I'm certainly coming across a lot of people who are not in particularly involved in social media, not that active in social media, not on X or Twitter used to be, is now known or whatever. And they get this. They get that there's some kind of new intolerance out there that has found its way to the heart of government that would prefer to close down debate rather than to let the free exchange of ideas uh, take place. And if the government, as I hope they are, are getting that message that there's a fairly wide chunk in society that know that there's something wrong with this legislation, then then they may be inclined to listen to us, those putting down amendments, their, their, and their own members, and we may see some concessions, but there hasn't been any sign of it so far. Well, I just want to go back to, uh, uh, you raised a couple of points there that I want to go back to, but one of them is you you, you rhymed off a list of senators there that um, kind of were the last line of a defense, if you like, before this um, legislation kind of got through the Shannon. Um, it, it, it comes to a point that this, you know, this more or less sailed through the doll without any uh, trouble. What exactly happened in the Shannon? And I think this this is going back a, a few months now. But you know, you you you, you reference Senator Chambers, which again was noteworthy because she's a member of the government that's pushing. You know, yeah. she's a member of a party that's in the government that's pushing this. And she's a leader of the House at the moment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. So what what exactly happened there that you were able to make to put the brakes on, if you like? Well, it's true what you say that it, it went it went through the doll very quickly, really, and, and and that often happens with legislation. There can be different reasons for that. I think that for all its faults, the Shannon um, sometimes gives a voice to you know personalities, and I include myself in that on a good day. You know who who find uh, and you know expose an angle on things that wasn't exposed in quite the same way in the doll, or that wasn't picked up on. And I think this. Um, where it came to debate in the Shannon, as you know, it has come to what's called the second stage debate. So, so legislation has to go through five stages in each house before it can go to the president for signing. The first and the fifth stage are, are basically formalities. The first stage you present the, 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 the legislation. The second stage is where every member gets the government presents the bill or whoever's presenting the bill. It could be a private member's bill. Every member gets to make one speech and the government then uh, responds and really then you get to the meat of it at committee stage the third stage where amendments can be put down and debated over and back and then the fourth stage is the report stage where it's tidied up the government might bring forward amendments in response to things that developments or things that have been said in the debate or other things going on and then it's, it's wrapped up so we've just begun in the shannon which was just, which was what was the second stage debate and that was really where if you like the initial shots were fired by different senators about how we felt about the legislation, about what we thought was right with it, what we thought was wrong with it. and But I think even before it got to that stage, uh, people like myself and Sharon had been busy in social media, other non-elected politicians busy and active, some groups and organizations being heard. And I think, you know, we were working hard to try and get the mainstream media to take a greater level of interest in this than they had before that. And I think they still haven't actually uh, scrutinized this legislation enough in, in what's called the mainstream media. But, you know, there were, I suppose, key moments. The government sent out their um, their senator, um, um, Barry Ward, to, to bat on this, to be the kind of the, the defender of this legislation in the Shannon. And Barry's a very competent person. He's a legal person but he's just giving the government line and defending that. Um, and we, we, we've had some media interactions and no doubt we will continue to do so and also in the Shannon. Um, but as to what what made the difference, I think it definitely, I think social media definitely has played a big role. Um, but also I think just there's that kind of peculiar entity that is the Shannon, which on occasion brings forward certain voices that can be quite strong and insistent around around issues that maybe got overlooked by the parties and, and indeed by the doll as well previously. You, you know, one of the things you brought up there, you know, the media and uh, mainstream media will say, and one of the things I suppose, you know, people like me and people, you know, that circles that I would be um, going around in or have been very active on the, this hate, the 
the dangers of this hate speech legislation for a long time and i think anyone you talk to on the street this concept of there being almost a social media ireland that the government is reacting to or creating hysteria on and we'll say the ordinary person on the street who basically has 15 minutes a day to catch up on the news and they look at a tweet or they might look at a clip but they're not really engaged but you know when you bring hate stuff like hate speech to them they'd kind of almost say to you should that could that couldn't they don't know anything about it number one and number two it's like sure that couldn't be happening kind of thing you know that's not that's not really happening and i'm and to tie it in with the media and i just it's like i'd almost see the media and government are on the same page narratively speaking on this now why media would be not the first people up in arms about any proposed good bad or indifferent uh, mm -hmm. on hate speech is a curiosity to me is it a curiosity to you as to why they haven't you know just from their own point of view yeah um no i won't say a curiosity look there's certain observations that i that i'd make about social media and 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 mainstream media and first of all uh, or what i call mainstream or traditional media for, first of all i would say i i kind of need to um to put my hand up and say i'm not really a poster boy for for social media and all that it entails i actually I'm quite a conservative in my approach to to media consumption um because i suppose i learned a long time ago um that one of the one aspect of social media many strong points and there, there are problematic aspects to it but certainly it's the good the bad and the ugly you know on on, on social media i'm not saying it's not like that <laughs> on mainstream media there's a bit of that too maybe a bit more subtle but it, it's the good the bad and the ugly on social media and i learned a long time ago that people can be going out to attack you and reason or courtesy or you know uh, having a, a reasoned argument doesn't come into it for some people they just want to hurt their opponent for reasons that might have to do with trying to score a political point or they might be working out some issues themselves and i did discover and it is years and years ago that i discovered that that, that it wasn't a good idea for me personally for example to re if i put something up on 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 on, on what was twitter or, you know or post on x now that not necessarily a good idea for me to to go reading what was said and uh, and I still don't I mean obviously friends would keep an eye on things you know if there was something there was something libelous we, we'd be we'd be going after the bag of money the same as the next person but 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 more seriously you know you keep an eye on it to see what's said but I have found that you know why would you give uh, why would you expose yourself to be vulnerable to to people who previously only had toilet walls to write on you know and who use uh, social media to to be really ugly and 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 to try and weaken your enthusiasm for the work that you're trying to do in all sincerity so i tend to use social media with that with that kind of cautious approach which is i use it to get ideas out there the media pick up on it so it's a very helpful way of kind of an alternative to sending out a press release but i am of course conscious that i've just painted the negative side there the positive side of social media is there are lots of people who have ideas, who have thought through their position, who do believe in the common good, but who are not necessarily asked by the Irish Times or the Irish Independent to write an opinion piece. They can might get a letter published from time to time, but they have more to say than they'd ever get a chance to say in mainstream media unless they're willing to go on the Joe Duffy show and be really sensationalist and then be kind of drawn into a whole political narrative around things. But there's people who want to communicate ideas to test ideas to give, they make their contribution to argue uh, forward and back. And social media has made that possible. And, and it has challenged the ability of mainstream media to close down free thinking uh, completely. And it is, it is certainly a challenge to the ability of, of, a, of a political establishment that would like, that has tendencies now that it wants to kind of control what exactly we think about things and the way we think about things. So there is a great liberation there. There's a great variety of social media. As I said, it has its problems. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's also the problem, of course, that people who only want to hear their own point of view can get drawn into particular spaces on digital media without allowing their ideas to be challenged. So it can be a it can be something that fosters snowflake culture just as much as it can be something that challenges a uh, snowflake culture. But overall, I think it, it's liberating. There are standards needed. There's regulation needed. We could have a debate, for example, about whether it's appropriate that people can have a kind of an anonymous presence on social media. Shouldn't you be willing to stand up and put your name behind what you say 
On the other hand, if you're a Chinese dissident, you know, there's no way you can safely do that and speak up for democracy. Uh, so, you know, they're, 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 it, it's never it's never straightforward. So social media, good, the bad and the ugly, there's some really terrible things about it. I find myself being quite cautious in the way that I use it. But nonetheless, there is a great liberation too. And it is putting manners to some degree on those elements that are in, in, in what's more a media and political establishment that would like to completely close down debate or only have it uh, on their own terms. And remember, I'm somebody who has been, whether I'm right or wrong, I, I try and you know tell the truth as I see it on the basis of the facts that I have them. I have been on the losing side of several debates on social issues, not losing in my view in terms of losing the, the argument, but certainly losing the vote. And I have been a critic of mainstream media for years about the way stuff got manipulated. So for example, in the abortion debates and the coverage of abortion um, that led up to the to the repeal referendum, the result of which was quite clear cut in 2018. Nonetheless, over the years in the media, you had a constant soft focus um, on you know so-called hard cases on one side of that issue, but never a focus on the hard cases that changing the law would create. Uh, a tendency to lionize those who want to change uh, and, and to give them pretty soft treatment, a tendency uh, to ask the hard questions then of the side that was that you know that was not in vogue in the media's eyes and this goes back a long way it's a cultural thing it's I, I, like i i studied i did a master's in journalism in dcu um back in 1992 93 shortly after i left just after i left ucg in fact and i can remember out of a class of 25 or 30 people and we all got on very well it was a lovely class but i think i was the only person to declare a pro-life position you know when that came up in discussion and there might have been one or two other secret sympathizers but at, but if that was the complexion of what was emerging into journalism um uh, you know from that particular nursery of journalism and it was a very fine course i did in dcu and i really appreciate that having been taught by people like john horgan and brian trench and colin kenny and people i have a lot of time for but in terms of the the values there just wasn't the diversity of values around social issues. These people mostly saw themselves as kind of turning their back on an old Ireland that had nothing credible to say as they saw it. Um, so this is this culture has been taken on in, in our media and our mainstream media for a long time. Um, there's also then, of course, a financial aspect, because once certain ideas come to dominate um, and once you have a certain capturing of kind of the corporate world, then the thing starts reflecting those ideas back to itself. So, you know, there's, there's, there, you're going to lose, you might potentially lose revenue if, if you go too much against the grain uh, mm -hmm. of, of dominant thinking. Unless, of course, you're, 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 you're so outrageous as to become a, a kind of a, a form of entertainment. But that isn't mm -hmm. advancing kind of the search for truth and goodness and the common good in society. So what am I saying? In a long-winded way, I'm saying there has been a problem in the mainstream media for a long time that is, there has been a certain sameness um, in terms of the values and opinions on a certain range of issues. It's obviously going to be apparent to a person like myself because I'm on the minority side of some of those issues. Maybe the farmers and other uh, sectors, and I have an interest in that side of life as well, maybe they feel that there's other uh, there's bias to be found there but generally in economic matters let's say in climate issues now you're seeing a, a a kind of a dominant voice but you know if you listen to the chagas guy you know yeah. talking on countrywide on a saturday morning it's still possible to get a view that you know it can't all be about clamping down on the dairy herd you know yeah, and, yeah. and they will they will, you know so, so you do hear some diversity uh, on some issues but generally i think that the mainstream there has been this kind of um I suppose intellectual capture, uh, philosophical capture, political capture of, of 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 the great majority of practicing mainstream journalists. I don't think I'm being too unfair there. Then no. you have the connection with the state. So let's say during COVID, and I had very mixed feelings about. You know, again, I'm you know probably quite a conservative person in my approach. I tend to go along with the with the kind of the rules for society. I kind of see a value in us all trying to rub along together, going along with things that discommode us. I'm you know not maybe the first person to stand on my rights, but nonetheless uneasy about just kind of the the way everybody had to be on board around some of the messaging during the during the during the pandemic. So that like let put it this way, at a certain point, 
even if there was a good argument for wearing masks at a certain point of the debate, they weren't really going to let it be discussed because the government didn't want it to be discussed at that point. You know, just mm -hmm. take one it's the bitsy part of that debate. You just felt that the highest value was not telling you the full truth. And that, that comes across now. Um, and and probably we see the same thing with immigration. Again, I have, you know... Oh, but but don't we, we, we see... So liberal on that, but... But um, I suppose no, when, 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 we, when we take that route where we, we accept, where, where a society starts to accept that, you know, it's kind of okay not to tell the full truth, We've seen a kind of steamrolling of that onto other topics coming out of COVID, whether it's on, you know, in the immigration of the last couple of years, whether it's on the climate, as you've outlined, the LGBTQ. It becomes a state where there's only one view and anything outside of it is targeted, is suffocated, is, you know, I could use more nefari nefarious terms than that. Yeah, but one, yeah. one, one point I want to ask you there is because, we, you know, you, you gave a, a, a very good kind of overview of the, of the media there. If we take it to a, a specific point, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you to a pr the protest two weeks ago outside yeah. the doll that um, I was at myself, although I was... Uh, got there after the Healy Ray incident, but that was exploded in the media over the next two or three days. Now, you were somebody that was, uh, you know, probably back in the dollar that area that day. What were your thoughts on, on what's based specifically that protest? Um, well, I, I think it was John McGurk of Gripped that said that they, that they had, uh, you know, done a lot to make the case or had done a lot to give political impetus to the drive to bring forward the hate speech legislation, which I would say, you know, I hope he's wrong. And I, it, it's not that he felt that they, that legislation should be brought forward, but he was clearly saying that, you know, there were people out there who certainly hurt the cause of, of, of challenging the, the group thing. I should say, first of all, I, I wasn't, um, I didn't see what happened on the Kildare Street side. I saw a bit of a skirmish, um, as I was leaving Leinster House, actually, just to go to the funeral of a, of a person I knew, a former student of mine, as it happens, around three o'clock. And I just saw, you know, what I would regard as an ugly, but not absolutely, not a dangerous, but an ugly kind of exchange um, between a, a, a couple of people and the Gardaí on the Merrion Square side. And I later heard then that there was maybe about 200 people there and there was some really ugly, uh, toxic stuff going along. Uh, what I said on Red FM, I think the following Friday, is that clearly there were, on, on that day, there were the wrong people um, campaigning in the wrong way uh, about the wrong issues, perhaps, or maybe not to be even clear what issues they were campaigning on, but that in that group there may well have been the right people campaigning in the right way, i.e. not offensively and democratically and courteously, you know, uh, about, about issues that need to be spoken about. Of course, what, what happens here is that if there is a worst element, and there's been a worst element in Irish life for years, and again, I pointed out, I think on that program and subsequently, there was a time when Angus O'Snodig and a bunch of Sinn Féin activists caused a ruckus and a breach of the peace at the uh, outside the Dáil. Um, there was the time Paul Murphy and other people on the on the hard left or the extreme left um, acted in a very unacceptable way towards the then minister, Joan Burton, and, and uh, barricaded them, her in the car. And in fairness, there was coverage about those things that time. But there's all, there, there seems to be a certain desire in some quarters to kind of take what happened that day recently outside the Dáil and say, this is something new that never existed in Irish society before. And it's something to do with those people who have um, concerns about whether it's immigration or transgender controversies or so on. And that's too easy and it's too simplistic. I prefer to take the view that, you know, I think it's immoral and I'm an old fashioned person in that respect. I'm willing, and I think we should use that language. I think it's immoral to campaign in a way that uses foul language that threatens violence. I think the thing that characterizes both the extreme left and the extreme right in politics and always has done is their willingness to resort to violence if they can't win the argument, if they can't win over the voters. And um, 
and, and I'm against that. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, like I think uh, every, every every reasonable person is exactly. And and therefore, I, there's, there's some unreasonable person people that infiltrate a crowd and uh, act in an utterly unacceptable way. Yeah, that's why we have public order legislation. That's why we have legislation already on the books to deal with that. And I think the Gardaí made 13 arrests. And if there should have been more, then there should have been more arrests or whatever. But um, what we should not tolerate is attempts then to take the activities of that unacceptable minority to... Uh, to tar the whole debate that needs to take place around some of these issues and where the government isn't given answers. And I had an exchange, uh, you know, I, I, I responded uh, quite strongly to an interview on News Talk in which Joe Brawley uh, tried to do exactly that. He tried to link uh, those protests to, you know, even much more dangerous stuff that had going on, you know, neo-Nazis beating people up in London and then linking it into some of us politicians who dared to oppose the hate speech legislation. And I felt I had to go to war over that because that is, that's a form of um, intimidation in itself to try and close down the debate. Say if you dare well, speak, uh, you know, Joe Brawley has, Joe, Joe Brawley has form on that. Yeah, well, I don't you follow know, the guy. Going back, uh, well, if you got, like, I, I, I would know, well, yeah. I, I'd have been following him a long time, but what I'd say is he's, a, he's you know, he takes a sensationalist position yeah. and you'd wonder sometimes, is it just because of the sensationalism? Does he really truly believe these things? I doubt he does deep down, you know, is the way I kind of look at him. But I suppose one thing on the, you know, on that protest and what I would say as someone that is you know, against the hate speech legislation and a, a wave of stuff that is going on here for the last two years is that, to be fair, these, um, what, the output of what happened that day frightens people that who are, you know, you, 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 you mentioned there was 200 people there. When I go to protests like this, what the big thing for me is I can't understand why there isn't 20,000 people there. Because I know that number of people exists that are against, you know, that are questioning a lot of the stuff that's going on for the last two years. And I think the output of what happens from that is, you know, and I, to be fair, would have said with some that was was badly, badly organized, badly managed. And you have to be careful of what can happen when that when that when, you, when that organization isn't in place beforehand. Yeah. Um, but what I would say is one of the bad things is obviously it kind of almost makes the case for the hate speech legislation because you know the media are going to amplify it to the max, the politicians the same. But also for me, the big point is it makes ordinary people afraid to get out and protest or, and you know use their right to protest. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say it makes the case because it absolutely doesn't because the hate speech legislation had nothing to do with that event. Nothing that the hate speech legislation was bringing in would have prevented or could prevent or would have added extra power to prosecute anything that went on that day outside the doll that we deem to be unacceptable, that reasonable people regard as unacceptable. The laws are already there to deal with that, okay? There is no particular statement that was brought to anybody's attention. Okay, there was a there was a talk about a noose or something ugly like that being a display of that. Well, that's incitement to violence. The legislation is there. If you want to get that, the legislation is there to deal with it. It certainly, there was nothing mentioned that was about, you know, inciting hatred however you define it, towards any group of people with protected characteristics, which, what, which is what the hate speech legislation is supposed to be about. So it didn't actually make the case for the hate speech legislation. But of course, what it did do was give political momentum to those who would use it in a kind of a bait and switch situation. And I'm not sure if it's a bait and switch, but it would say, look, this is why we need hate speech legislation. And because it's somehow connected with hatred that to convince people, oh yeah, we really must stop that kind of behavior. And, you know, for any mainstream politician or media person to make that argument is really to engage in very dishonest, dishonest argument that should be very um, uh, quickly exposed. So I was kind of, watching very carefully to see who would dare actually come out and claim that this made the case for hate speech legislation because you could clearly demonstrate that it doesn't. It demonstrates yeah. the case for using existing legislation. And in fact, if people were to come out and 
try and manipulate it in that way. Well, that would be, you know, the very example of misinformation and establishment shutdown of truthful inquiry that has people like myself and yourself worried about the hate speech legislation as it currently stands in the first place. No, now, you made a second I forgot, but I went off on one there on the question of whether it's. No, it, no, it, you're it, right. I went off on one myself there. I've um, I forgot myself what I was, what I, what the, the second part of that question was. But I suppose all of this kind of leads us into, you know, and I, I kind of see these two subjects linked, you know, the hate speech legislation, but also the LGBTQ transgender, but specifically, I think transgenderism. Yeah. Um, and what we're seeing rolled out into our schools now um, across the country. And we've seen, you know, we've seen other protests, other people doing protesting on this subject. There, you know, when I look at them, it's usually the same people that are kind of um, speaking out on those two subjects. Um, where are you on what's going on with the SPHE and the education sector on, uh, on, um, transgenderism and will basically you know flesh that out yeah well look at i've been i've been very critical of this look for a long time it, it, people have been i suppose rightly conscious of the need to be careful about how they speak around lgbt issues because in the end and this is certainly my one of my guiding principles is I'm not interested in talking about or criticizing any other person's private life. And, I, and that's what I thought. That's what I thought was the great compromise in modern society, that people were allowed to get on with their private life. And to the extent that we had arguments about social issues like abortion or euthanasia or the marriage referendum, that it would take place on grounds that had to do with whether third parties would be affected by the changes in the law that were taking place. So, for example, in the marriage referendum, my arguments were about, you know, the relevance of the nuclear family of father and mother, whether people agree or not, that it, that, that, that should be the social ideal and that redefining marriage in the way that took place in that referendum had implications in that area. It certainly wasn't ever about commenting on, you know, on people's private emotional, you know, lives. Um, so, so that's where I thought, you know, where I felt things should have been at. But what we have seen, um, I suppose, in recent years is that it, it goes beyond that because you're, 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 it isn't just a matter of people respecting each other's private lives. You're not allowed to have a different view on some of these issues. You are expected not just to respect other people's private lives um, or personal choices, but you're actually expected to publicly affirm them. And therefore, we have you know huge amounts of money uh, being spent for example, on Pride Month, you know, um, the Department of Agriculture building here where I work is festooned with Pride, pride colors. Trans, uh, the transgender Pride flag was, was flying from the Department of Justice. You have Dublin County Council going way out on, on it as well and, and, and so many other institutions. Now, what's my problem with that? My problem with that is that it is creating an, a privileged exception among all the other causes uh, that, that 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 people might believe in, or people might believe deal with, with you know need support. Like if you if we fly the Ukrainian flag, it's the flag of another country. We're supporting them because they've been unfairly and unjustly and brutally invaded. If we fly the European Union flag, we are flying the flag of an institution uh, of of nations. You know, um, um, whether it's a super state or not is a matter of uh, you know well, political. Into that, but like, but it is a. Uh, it is a part of our lives and it is a legally established, um, um, you know, built on treaties, uh, international institutions, and so on. The pride flag, it's not its not clear what it means or what particular set of values. I mean, if it's about just including everybody, regardless of difference, then everybody would wave that flag. But, but, but who decided that that flag represented that and was to be, you know, what about, for example, people with disabilities? What about people who are persecuted for their faith internationally? What about people who um, are, are, are living, are homeless? What about people who are living in dire uh, poverty? Uh, these are all sections of our community that have an equal claim on our uh, compassion and respect. But, but there's only one brand that is being promoted and at taxpayers expense without it ever having been been discussed now to some degree 
you know, you accept that and you say, okay, well, the majority thinking seems to support this use of public money. There are lots of ways in which the state spends uh, our money, sometimes well and sometimes very badly. I, I personally would question, you know, the the, the huge investment in, in, in flags because I think what there's an attempt to curate the national mood around a whole set of issues, but without actually defining to us what it is we're supposed to believe in. And there might be aspects of it that I strongly disbelieve in. I think what the what the, the T in the LGBT thing has made this problem acute because people are, you know, rightly concerned that um, children's welfare may be at stake. For example, it, it, you know, we, we've talked about it, and I'm sure both of us in different fora, the problem of biological males presenting as females, inhabiting women's spaces in schools, dressing rooms, prisons, prisoners have rights too, you know, and in all of those situations, potentially um, posing danger, there is the formation of young people and, and, and their understanding of reality. And if, for example, there's a desire to have uh, schools um, inculcating, you know, a belief that you can actually change your sex really and truly, as opposed to the physical manifestation of your sex, then, you know, lots of people, honest people, caring people have a problem with that. Now, this is not to say that the problem is the transgender person or the person with gender dysphoria. It no. never is. It shouldn't be. That person deserves support, compassion. As far as I'm concerned, they're a child of God, the same as you and me. And, you know, there's an awful lot I will do as a, as a matter of good manners to try and make their life easy, because I think it's already a very difficult hand to, to, to be, to be, play, to be um, dealt. But the problem is with the activists. And what they and and the way they are trying to redefine reality, and in ways that involve, I do believe, the sexualization of children. Because if you're if you're if you're drawing children into confusion at an early age about issues of gender and inviting them to believe things that are not true, that you can actually be another sex to the one that you actually are, you know, genetically and biologically, then then you you know you are. And all, and that has all sorts of ramifications then for what you teach them about relationships and how to express relationships and so on. And um, this is hugely problematic. And I think the, the 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 transgender activism rather than the transgender person with with dysphoria is what's causing the problem. And it is producing, um, I think, a backlash in society from people who are concerned, women, feminists in particular, who see the threat that this proposal poses to women's welfare, that sense of female distinctiveness that was a hallmark of feminism, and that, and that so much good stuff, some bad stuff, I'd argue, but so much good stuff grew out of, you know, that, that, that sense that men and women are different, equal, but different, uh, uh, and, and that difference now proposed to being, to being erased by transgenderism that basically says, you know, the borrows stereotypes and says, well, you know, if you're a, if you're a girl, but you're rather boyish, um, you know, you may be yeah, you 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 may be a boy instead of you know why stereotype anyway and suggest you know that there's something wrong with a girl who's a tomboy or whatever it is you know putting it in simple terms. So what what I think we're seeing something interesting here because uh, there there is a good cross section of society that is concerned about this, and, and I think part of the concern is that government doesn't seem to be listening. In fact, not only that, but government seems to be going in the other direction. And that's where it comes into the curriculum in schools. So, for example, there were attempts, there was some pullback by the by the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment, but there were attempts to import talk about gender being a spectrum, you know, and um, credit to, among others, and, you know, it's not politically correct to mention uh, the churches these days, but it was the Catholic Primary School Managers Association who warned against bringing this issue, this ideology into schools to young children at primary school level and said, you know, we already deal with these situations. We deal with them sensitively. You know, we don't, you know, penalize or push back, but nor do we affirm, you know, we're patient and careful and pastoral and this ideology doesn't help and and uh, so you see, you have that and and when the Seamus Mulconry of the Catholic Primary School Managers Association wrote to various ministers uh, expressing exactly that concern you had Michal Martin among others coming out and saying it was unhelpful of them to go public in that way to put their concerns in a letter now these are 
what I thought would be called social partners. They're partners in the delivery of education. They're responsible and play a key role in helping schools to be managed well. But suddenly it's a problem when they're concerned about aspects of the education policy and they have the cheek to go public about it in a way that annoys uh, the Tanishta. Um, I just thought that said an awful lot more about the government and their attitude to dissent. Um, you then had a similar in a subsequent moment um, in that letter that the CPSMA wrote, they referred to the social com contagion dimension uh, of this, because one of the problems around gender dysphoria, and there are books written about this, and particularly among young girls, that it seems to be socially transmissible. In other words, because of the way it's talked about, because of the way it's being dealt, more people are facing this challenge than would otherwise uh, face that challenge. When Seamus Mulconnery on the radio used the word contagion, he was immediately attacked for using this language because language was, which was deemed to be mm. offensive and so on. Now, in fairness to him, he held his point. He said, OK, let's talk about social transmission. He didn't use the word contagion. But look at what's happening here. Language is people are trying to control language in order to control thought. And, and I shut up now in one quick second, but I'll give you another <laughs> example of that. I'm on the end of life committee at the moment, which is looking at, sorry, the assistant <coughs> committee, which is looking at the question of whether euthanasia, as in the direct termination of a person's life at their request, or assisted suicide, you know, it's where a, 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 a third party assists but does not directly do it, whether that should be brought in, that those things both come under the umbrella of assisted dying, so called, whether that should be brought in in, in Ireland. And several times during the meeting of the committee, <coughs> had people, for example, who <coughs> dared to say, we do not believe, for example, that there should be any form of legalized killing. And immediately people jump on you and say, that is so offensive that you use the word killing. And uh, Or if they say, for example, well, you shouldn't use the word assisted suicide because it has nothing to do with suicide. Whereas the people making that point are saying, well, actually, if you introduce euthanasia in some form, even for some people, even with good and compassionate intentions, you actually make it harder to, to fight suicide in our society because you are sending out a message that the state is okay with certain lives being ended, people, certain people ending their own lives. Now, it, you see, my point here is that it's important for people who hold that point of view to say, let's not sanitize it. It is a form of killing. It's not, not, they're not saying it's murder because it, to be murder, it has to be non-consensual and it has to be against the law. But if it's legalized, it is a form of killing. Just the same as we've wanted to talk about abortion from a pro-life point of view, we see it as a form of killing. That's that, that's why we had such a problem with it in the first place. Now, to tell somebody you may not use the word killing because you're you're being offensive or you're offending me, or you may not use the word suicide because that's very you know divisive or offensive. What that in fact is trying to do is to control the language the other person uses in order to 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 basically corral them and their thoughts, and. And obviously the opposite version of that is you have this sanitizing, this, this euphemistic use of language then um, in order to make it more palatable to sell it. So the use of language here is a political act, uh, mm -hmm. is, is what I'm trying to say. And Michal Martin, you know, suggesting to the Catholic primary school managers that they shouldn't have written a letter expressing their concerns, even though it was perfectly temperate, perfectly polite, perfectly reasoned letter, unlike what he was saying, rooted in evidence and analysis and study. Mm -hmm. It, you, it, it's a political fight over language in order to score certain political objectives. Well, yeah, no, and there's a, a lot to unpack there, Ronan, and I was just try, um, jotting down a couple of notes, but I suppose the first one I was there is we're really talking about um, a, an, a form of compelled speech, and it kind of ties back a bit again, maybe to the hate speech legislation, and which leads to, you know, a unified or singular way of thinking about certain narratives. Because again, I would suspect what Martin is upset about is the Catholic Church has stepped out of line of the narrative that's being promoted. Um, and one question I wanted to ask you, you, you mentioned the word majority thinking there. You know, on the on the transgender stuff, I would be surprised if I would say maybe seventy to seventy five percent of the people, certainly in the country outside of Dublin, uh, maybe, yeah. are on the same page about all this stuff. It's not a, it's, yeah. but it, yet it's kind of presented as the majority thinking all this stuff is yeah. going on yeah, the schools, which I don't, yeah. which I don't think is true. But yeah. I suppose, um, what, how do people? Um, fight back 
against this because again one thing and it ties back to stuff we spoke about earlier is the people are being presented with stuff that in the media and by senior politicians that the majority of ireland want this and you're x y or z if you don't agree with it and on the other side was we have at least two ngos who are government funders who have their tentacles into the department of education and other departments and all of this stuff um being funded by the taxpayer yeah well there's a book by, as which I mean to read, I haven't re re read it yet, by Rod Dreher called Live Not By Lies. And it, it basically talked about communism and um, the totalitarian regimes there and sometimes the, the sacrifice that has to be made and the price that has to be paid by be people who believe in the truth is, that, is, to, is to speak up, you know? And, uh, and it, I think it's very important for our democracy that more and more people speak up. So the first thing uh, for people to do is to, is to have the courage uh, to speak. Now, there's also an obligation on us when we speak to have the courage, to, uh, to have the, the decency to seek the truth when we speak, you know, and not to speak or, you know, not to uh, emulate the other side, uh, not to tear everybody with the one brush, but not to engage in in the politics of saying whatever has to be said in order to win, regardless of whether it's true or not. You know, there's no integrity in that. So, so the first thing is to speak. The second thing is to is to speak truthfully. And the first requires courage, and the second requires integrity. Um, and um, and I think if more and more people do that, then sooner or later political pressure then goes back on to the establishment politicians. I think you're absolutely right when you say that certainly around the, the, the crazier aspects of the gender politics. And I used the phrase um, government within a government recently in one in one of my, my posts. And what I was saying there is that it does seem to me that in relation to the issue I discussed around the SPHE at junior um, at primary level and at secondary level, um, so far the government have not indicated that they are listening to public concerns, except to the limited extent that the NCCA withdrew um, um, aspects of the um, of the of the of the the curriculum. You know, the, the initial draft was was watered down specifically and particularly to deal with that uh, issue around proposing the idea that gender was a spectrum. But there hasn't been a, any any acknowledgement. Um, I suppose within the cabinet, uh, among the official voices, yeah, that there was a problem there. I mean, perhaps a more uh, extreme example of the problem has been highlighted by Professor Donal O'Shea, uh, the endocrinologist, who recently warned that in the um, in the in the search for and the proposal to appoint um, a HSE lead on 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 on, on transgenderism, um, that the uh, that they weren't going to appoint uh, a person or weren't requiring that the person would have you know clinical medical experience and that he feared that that basically that job was going to be filled by an activist so here you have the hse by i mean the argument is between on the one hand the sensible mainstream of the national gender service which has been involved in assisting people with the transitioning business as adults, which is worried about the massive influx of young people uh, with, with gender dysphoria, co with, with co-presenting issues like autism in a very high percentage of cases. And the on the one hand, the sensible people saying, we need to slow this down. We don't just rush people onto a transitioning uh, path uh, involving um, uh, puberty blockers, uh, cross-sex hormones, and eventually surgeries. And that's what we saw when people were sent, you know, the Tavistock route in, in Britain. On the other hand, then the the, the activists and the ideologues uh, within the kind of the transgender side saying, you affirm the person, you believe them, and you go with what they want. Crudely speaking, that's what they're proposing. And right now, it's not clear. It still looks like the government is siding with that side instead of taking the medically informed, evidence-based, sensible approach that would look at issues like, can people move beyond this dysphoria as young people? And there's huge evidence that most can and would, um, that the introduction of puberty blockers, however, prevents people from moving beyond it, or what's called desisting 
Nonetheless, despite this huge potential harm, you have the ideologues seem to have the ear and the support of government. And that's what I mean when I talk about um, government within government. And I was asked by Neil Prendival on Red FM, you know, was I saying that there was kind of gay people in the government kind of pushing it down? I said, I am not interested in talking about people's private lives. I'm not interested in having that conversation. It is the agenda that matters. It's the political uh, um, uh, decisions that matter. And it doesn't matter whether it's Michal Martin or Leo Varadkar or Roderick O'Gorman or, or Norma Foley. Let's focus on what they're proposing. Let's argue about whether it's right or wrong, whether it's harmful to children. I am suggesting that it is very harmful, just as I am suggesting that the government being tolerant of pornographic material being available to children as young as 12 in the young adult section of, um, of public libraries, that their failure to call that out, to take steps to prevent it, to deal with whatever quangos are imposing that kind of material and making them available uh, in libraries, their failure to deal with that is a dereliction of, uh, of their duty, particularly in the area of child protection. And the parents of this country have every right to be horrified by that. And, and that's not in any way to excuse any kind of unacceptable campaigning that might go on in or outside those libraries. That's always a different matter. How we behave is crucial if we want to promote our cause. A just cause doesn't justify um, uh, injustices in the way people promote them. But I think there's a key point I need to make about this. I've given you several examples. And you knew about them already. The libraries, the the, the gender transitioning, um, what's been going on in schools and on the curriculum. You say rightly, I think, that the vast majority, and there have been some opinion polls that I've seen, the vast majority of the public are against this. The government might say with some justification the vast majority of the public are not ready to vote on this issue primarily. And I think that, so we might say the vast majority of the public are against it. The government might say, ah, yes, but the vast majority of the public are willing to put up with it, you know, if mm -hmm. we focus on other things. And that might be cynical, but that is the way government operates. And that's why it's so important for more and more people to do the research, to do the study, to dare to speak up, courteously but insistently and say sorry that is not good public policy that is endangering children you should be on it you are on the wrong track and it is a voting issue uh, it's it may not be an economic issue it may not put more or less money into my pocket but the welfare of children should be our, and of the most vulnerable in society should always be our highest priority and obviously children are always high uh, on that list and should be so we need more activism on the ground to get more people putting pressure on the government to say you need to change course on these issues yeah no i suppose when you say the government with the government is i suppose it comes to a question a simple one is who is running the government and i suppose this is where in in a sense you what you're saying is a lot of the if we take if we if we snip off the if we snip off the politics for a second and just focus on the ideology we'll say off oh, the transgender uh, a lot of the transgender stuff but also a lot of the climate stuff what we find is the idea these ideologies did not originate out of the soil of ireland they can you know they've, they've come into you know we've adopted them from other countries and and, and stuff like that and we have an ngo class thing that is here with um foundations in place to promote them and you know they're funded to do it to a certain degree but for me the question becomes is how autonomous are our government in terms of the decisions these big decisions that we're making that are kind of generational decisions um because sometimes i feel if with especially with the trans stuff is that in some way, this is an attack on the family. It's an, you know, it's an attack on women, and specifically, I think, but it's almost like an attack on the family unit as to, right. you know, expanding that out um, exponentially as to what that might mean, but really kind of destroying that unit in the long term. Yeah, well, look, at I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on these, but I mean, obviously, you have to keep abreast of trends and, in, you know, intellectual and cultural trends. And the phrase queer theory would describe, I suppose, a philosophy of these issues that basically says that anything goes, you know, and, and that it's all about what the adults want. And we should be very worried um, for child protection, you know, the more 
that ideology uh, takes hold. And there are plenty of examples historically and in the, in the in recent decades in Europe for, you know, it's, it's, it's astounding what some of these ideologues actually come to believe in and come to advocate. And I think parents uh, would be horrified, you know, the more they would hear about it. So let's just say that, you know, queer theory is this idea that anything goes in, in this sexual domain. Let's put it this way. It's all about what the adults want. And um, that, that that is deeply problematic. And is there an international dimension to this? Well, yeah, but I certainly think there is in that you have NGOs that are getting their funding you know, from the likes of George Soros and Open Society Foundation. That foundation, for example, has employed and nurtured over the years many of the, the judges who ended up in the European Court of Human Rights. And the question, the, the, the potential for capture there has been pointed out by the European Centre for, for Law and Justice. Uh, at European Union level, there's clearly a kind of, a, again, a dominant uh, thinking. But the one thing, I, the, and I'm not suggesting, you're suggesting this, but all that said, however, we might say there are international influences and there are international bodies and there's a kind of a, like an international peer pressure where, you know, Leo Varadkar and Michal Martin and others like to kind of stride the world stage and say, look at how progressive Ireland is, is become. We now abort children. You know, we now, you know, we, we redefine marriage in our constitution. Aren't we great? Look at us now. While at the same time then kind of warning about apparently emerging homophobia simply because people object to hate speech that would close down language around uh, gender controversies. Um, but as much as there is that kind of international peer pressure, which our political leaders, sadly, to my mind, and I don't, don't want to say they're all bad. They're good people in lots of ways. They're, they're, they love their country. They're trying to serve the common good as they see it. All I'm saying is that some of their ideas are very, very toxic and they need to be called out on that. But what I am not definitely not saying is that it is all some kind of foreign imposition, you know, and that Ireland isn't really to blame. You know, in the end, we, the people of Ireland, we make our choices about who governs us, about what TV we watch, about what we let children do in terms of access to smartphones, about what we let them see, about whether or not we have conversations with them about virtue and how life ought to be lived, love of neighbor and love of self and so on. And, you know, if then we choose leaders, you know, who persuade us in concert with others down bad paths on certain social issues, not on every issue, but on certain social issues, um, we can't just say it as kind of some kind of foreign influence in our country that we need to root out. You know, it's our own hearts in the end that we always have to start by changing. I think it was the Russian author Solzhenitsyn who said that the line between good and evil goes down through every human heart, you know? So as much as I like kind of ranting on here about what's wrong, I, I, I have to acknowledge that you know, <laughs> the problem here starts with me, you know, and you. Um, G.K. Chesterton, um, supposed to have, I don't, I, I never found this. And some things that G.K. Chesterton is supposed to have said that it's actually hard to find where he said it, you know. But one of them <laughs> was that he is supposed to have uh, responded to a, a competition in the London Times, which invited people to write in letters to the editor to say what's wrong with the world. And Chester is supposed, Chesterton is supposed to have written, you know, dear sir. I am, full stop, yours sincerely, GK. <laughs> so if he didn't say it, he should say it. It's something we should all remind ourselves of every day. If we just start with what's wrong with the world, start with yourself. Well, I suppose what you're really saying there, Ron, in, in we'll put a flip a positive sense in it, is Irish people still have agency to change the thing, you know, stuff like the try, um, you know, the, and I look at it as an ideology as opposed to um, anything else. Um, that Irish people still have agency over their own lives and that we still have agency if we use, you know, if we stand up and we vocalise our, our concerns over the future of the country. Exactly. And I mean, I think we've just got to encourage, as I say, all, each other, you know, speak up and not just speak up, but speak up for the truth, you know, and mm -hmm. that's it, seek the truth, uh, because it's not much good speaking up otherwise, you know. Now, I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll we'll, we'll, relax into the end of this i've 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 a final question as outside of the politics i was just doing a bit of research and i see that you were you, you've worked for a time in the archdiocese of dublin as a yes. in their communi communications yeah. department 
mm. and I can you know, I can feel from the conversation that pro life and faith are probably you know very mm. strong elements of your life. And I just wanted to speak a bit about that experience of working in you know that environment, you know, yeah. in what it was like working in that environment and what kind of issues you were facing as you know yeah. communications um, person for the Archdiocese of Dublin. Yeah, look, there were five and a half very enjoyable years, actually. I, I had been working in, in uh, Dundalk Regional Technical College, as it then was, um, in, in, um, a, as, a, as an administration officer. And it was a very enjoyable job and lovely people there. But I suppose I had been involved in pro-life stuff and so on. And uh, anyway, I was invited to join the communications office of the Dublin Diocese when Desmond Connell was Archbishop. He later became a Cardinal. And it was at a difficult time because there had been controversies about the handling of, you know, the, um, the emerging problem of sex abuse cases in the church. The scandal and the horror of all of that ha had begun to hit. And I suppose it was partly in response to that that the it was the Dublin Diocese decided, you know, we need to set up a, a communications office to to deal with media and the public about these things, not not spin. In fact, I remember my boss, Father John Dardis, pointing to us all and say, listen, it's the truth that will set you free here, you know, and let's go out to the whole world and tell the good news. It's not tell tell people what you want them to hear so that they'll do what you want them to do. Um, but, but clearly it was against the background of, of, of those scandals emerging. And there were certainly some very challenging times when you know there would be media focus from time to time about particular scandals, you'd have to find out what happened, what went wrong, what should never happen again, and also, and I was very conscious of this from the start, and what needs to be said in fairness about what where sincere efforts were being made to deal with a situation. I suppose at that stage, I was very conscious of the fact that there was a bit of a, there was absolutely justified horror and outrage that that such cases had happened, but there was also I sensed and still believe a kind of a, a desire in some quarters to take to draw political capital out of that situation because if you can weaken the church as a voice in society you were kind of weakening some of your opponent your, your one of your big opponents if you were looking for a change around things like abortion and, and other issues you know so any reasonable political mind would say it that there can be different reasons to be active in a particular area. There can be very good reasons that are all about the merits of the case, but there can also be people trying to make political capital. I suppose I would have been conscious of that, and therefore, right from the start, I would have felt that, you know, if there's media, if there's a need to challenge the media sometimes about the way they cover certain things, we should do it, and we should seek a, a right of reply. So I probably would have been seen as, at best, energetic, sometimes at worst, maybe a bit aggressive on that point. Um, but, but you know, that was a shared view in our office that we should be proactive. I think we were a well-regarded office because we did show for the ball. We did pick up the phone when journalists uh, came calling. And, of course, there was the very positive side as well, that you were helping... Uh, people to communicate their ideas, you know, maybe helping them write articles. Uh, we did communication sessions, or let's say Crosscare was producing, which is an agency of the Dublin Diocese, was producing reports about, you know, uh, fighting drug addiction, and or it could be an event involving the St. Vincent de Paul Society locally or whatever. All of that positive pastoral stuff was going on as well, and you were, you know, having fun trying to I, I mean that because working. No, no, I, I don't. I don't disagree. Yeah, I, I remember. I remember on one occasion, um, there was this famous organist uh, called Olivia Latry, you know, who uh, who who uh, came to the Pro Cathedral, and he was kind of. I mean, not many people would follow organ music, and I like it, the sound of an organ, but I don't necessarily go back to hear it for hours on end. I just like it at the end of mass on Sunday. But this particular guy was a big name in the organist world, anyway. And I remember uh, getting the press release, uh, press release out, and I had a little bit of an inspiration. I put on the headline: "French Flair Comes to the Pro Cathedral." And I remember Pat Kenny reading out my press release, and I felt as I can go home and sleep the rest of the day now. My job is done, you know. And then on another occasion, they were. Um, they were, there was a vocations promotion campaign in the diocese, and they drew on the uh, on the concept of the movie The Men in Black. You know, who are the men in black? Do you remember that movie? Mm -hmm. So the, I suppose the idea clergy wearing, you know, black and uh, and the white collar. So it kind of might seem like a strange idea to promote vocations. But again, it was a way of getting people talking about the good work that priests were doing and, you know, not to forget that despite the scandals and, the, you know, that you can have whitewashing and you can have blackwashing, you know, mm -hmm. and there was a need to get all the good stuff that was going on in the church and still goes on indeed. But but um, anyway, I remember they, they ran the concept of who are the men in black. But then by coincidence, um, 
the, with the All Blacks, they're, they're not the force they used to be, of course, we can all say quite happily, we're not afraid of the All Blacks anymore, but the All Blacks were in town, and obviously this was an opportunity for a photo shoot with some of the clergy wearing black and some of the All Blacks, and, and I wrote another press release, uh, you know, they go for the tries, we go for the conversions, you know, so I, 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 so pretty, pretty twee, and, uh, but I had fun on occasions doing that, but there was a great old community sense, and I think... Um, as a layman working in there, and there were plenty of lay people working in there, there was a kind of an appreciation of our efforts that we were we were trying to help, you know, the mission as well. So five and a half very satisfying years. It prepared me, I suppose, for, for argument and debate. I wasn't always on the popular side of the argument, as you can imagine. And I went from there then into journalism, writing weekly columns for the examiner, and then later getting a mandate for politics. So I kind of see it as, a, as having been a time in my life that was enjoyable, not something I could have done forever, but it was actually very formative of me because I was engaging with people who you know had faith, who had things to say about values and how the good life is to be lived and how do you love your neighbor and how do you apply that to laws on everything from prison reform to human reproduction and uh, meeting people who could actually help you understand that there was a reason for these arguments that you're not just kind of taking it down as a piece of dogma and not ever thinking about it you know i that was a real gift in my life because i had been brought up to think and to try and think and to be willing to think independently but again as I, going back to what i was saying earlier about speaking up it's not enough to speak and speak up it's not enough to to think independently you kind of have to do the spade work and try and understand well why do I think what I think, and can I give a good account of it? That's great. Yeah, thanks for that, Ronan. Um, I suppose I'm not going to ask um, take up any more of your time because we've come just past the hour mark there. So I really appreciate you doing this interview with me, and hopefully we might do one again in the future. Um, so I just want to say thank you, uh, Senator Mullen, and um, I'll just um, end the recording now.